Welcome to the Ancient Warfare Magazine Podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we'll be looking at Volume 8, Issue 3, Swift as the Wind Across the Plains, Horsemen of the Steps. Don't forget, if you've not yet read the magazine, you can find back issues at ancient-warfare.com. Joining me to discuss the topic is Joshua Browse, Mary Darm, Lindsay Powell, Mark McCaffrey and Owen Rees. But before we start, Joshua, would you like to tell us about your new venture, Ancient History Magazine? Yes, so at the ones from our publishers, we're thinking about doing a, a new magazine called Ancient History Magazine, which is going to be similar to Ancient Warfare, uh, except more devoted more broadly to the ancient world. Um, so it's not going to be about military matters, even though on occasion we might touch upon uh, some something warlike uh, when it suits a theme. Um, it's going to deal more with, with politics and, and religion and society. Um, every issue uh, we're going to be thinking will be slightly bigger than the, the average issue for Ancient Warfare. An issue of Ancient Warfare has 60 pages and this will be 68. Um, every issue will be focused on a particular theme, but there will be more space for non-theme related articles because you know the, the topic that we cover is so broad um, that there should be more space for articles that are not theme related. And I know a lot of authors are going to look forward to this also. Um, we're planning the, the Kickstarter, which will have launched by the time you see this podcast, I imagine. It's uh, March 18th, uh, 2015. Um, it'll run for 30 days. Uh, the money that we try to raise will be for um, issue number one. There will be stretch goals in place for a second issue. Uh, and if it's successful, we're, we're thinking about launching it as a going concern. So it's a bi-monthly magazine, just like Ancient Warfare, with uh, loads of in-depth articles, uh, still accessible, with uh, photographs of original objects, and, of course, custom artwork by our, drawn by our talented artists. And I think it's going to be lots of fun. The first issue... Issue number one is the, the one that we're currently planning for, for the Kickstarter also. We'll have the theme discoveries in the ancient world. So um, Hanno and um, exploration of the Indian Ocean and um, uh, voyages uh, to find um, amber, that sort of stuff. That's all going to be in the in issue number one that we're currently striving for. So if you're interested, you can, uh, you can support the Kickstarter. Uh, if you're still a bit on the fence, you can also download a sample PDF issue from the website. That's ancienthistorymagazine.com. It's uh, 10 pages PDF, free for all. You can get it from the web shop and from the website directly. Uh, and it has uh, three articles um, by myself, by uh, my co-editor, Jona Lindering, and by uh, regular contributor, Joe Hall. Um, the theme for that issue is Trajan's Markets. So... Cool. Right, so let's get back on topic. We're looking at Horsemen of the Steps. Um, when we're talking about the steps, should we fix geographically where we're actually talking about? It's, it's basically the, um, the the area covered by the issue. When we talk about these, these particular horsemen, these, these nomads, it's the, the Pontic Steps. So that's north of the, the, the Black Sea, uh, part of the the Caucasus and a little further north, and the the exact boundaries are a little um, un, under discussion, I think. But it, it's mostly steppe um, land, so so grassland basically. Yeah, as far as geography is concerned, that's more or less the area you have to look at. So it's it's also the area where Greeks first came into contact with these nomadic peoples when they settled the uh, coast of the Black Sea. It's also where uh, Persians interacted with Scythians, for example, when they crossed into um, Thrace and went north. Um, that that basic area is. It? So, I mean, it's, it's a huge area. Um, so, who were the horsemen of the steppes? Where where did they come from? Are they are we talking about lots of small tribes that popped up and come together? How who who were who were who were the the peoples? Um, well, there are a bunch of different um, uh, peoples involved uh, when you refer to the to the horsemen of the steppes. Uh, once again, we know them uh, largely by name from uh, sources other than these peoples themselves. Uh, and amongst the earliest are the Chimerians uh, that we hear of. Uh, you already have Chimerians in uh, Homer, but they're some sort of mythical race living at the edge of the world. The Chimerians that first enter history, uh, we know from uh, ancient Near Eastern sources and from Greek sources, uh, came down, uh, entered. Uh, Anatolia and uh, ravaged uh, the place. 
basically. Um, other peoples include the uh, Sarmatians and the, uh, the Scythians, of course, and the latter are probably the most um, familiar to people especially because Herodotus wrote, um, devoted quite a, a large part of his histories to the Scythians as well, um, mainly for reasons of, of symmetry in his case, because he wrote an entire book on the Egyptians and he also discussed the Scythians because they were on opposite ends of the world, basically, and they were among the most populous peoples in the ancient world, according to Herodotus too, so they formed a nice contrast um, between civilized Egyptians and the more barbarous uh, Scythians. But his uh, definition of the Scythians is a little bit vague at times. I mean, it seems that it can be overlapped with some of those other peoples that you mentioned. But uh, instead of saying Scythians are one particular group, I mean, there's all these suggestions about Scythians that maybe the, the Cimmerians are you know, somehow related into the Scythians, and you've got the Maschetti uh, as well, that somehow they are related, but the... the bonds between or you know, whether they are related or whether they're alliance tribes or whether they are coming from one origin seems to be all of a, a bit of a mess. Well it also gets um, more complicated than that when yeah. um, Herodotus then starts talking about Scythians who plough the land and then he talks about Scythians who are nomads and then he talks about e even within the same group so we've really got to try and undo our own obsession with uh, tribal groupings. So even Herodotus, although he talks about the Scythians as a, a set group, he creates these separate entities within it. I mean, we're not even talking about Cimmerians at this point, uh, even just within the same tribal group. You get um, it's, almost, it's quite similar to the Romans and their obsessions with you know, the Germanic tribes, and they sort of group together confederacies, but talk about them as one people. Is that, is that to do with the fact that they are marginal? The fact that the further you get away from civilizations, the more outlandish the, the stories become. Um, so is it, is it that idea that because you're dealing with such a large geographic area, um, you've got these sort of weirder and more far out stories and they become less supported? So pretty much you can say anything you want about these peoples and um, you know that, that they will be believed because it's like, well, it's far away, so it must be true. <laughs> yeah, it does seem a bit like that, doesn't it? Um, I suppose the other way uh, to think about it is um, there are common links. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit similar to the modern obsession with the word Celtic. Uh, and when you actually talk to archaeologists about your Celtic tribes and things like that, they actually go, mm, they really just have sort of cultural links and maybe a language link. You know, talking about them the same people doesn't work. But you can see why, like you say, why an outsider would band them together because you go, well, they're close enough. They're so mm. they must be the same. I suppose but, it's similar to what we do with the Greek polys. You know, we, we always talk about Greece as a country, and we, you know, every historian of the period knows it's not, but we still talk about it like it is. Well, and mm. even in the modern world, we, we talk very loosely about the, the Muslim world and the Middle yeah. East. I mean, that covers a, mm. a multitude of variation, and I think it's just uh, people who tend to write the histories like to organize things, and uh, rather than give people lists, they'll give you a a simple headline and that's what we'll work with. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's like somebody from Texas not, not wanting to be confused with somebody from New York, for example. <laughs> it's... it's uh, On principle. <laughs> yeah, but from an outside yeah. perspective, you're absolutely right. It, it's it's easier to lump yeah. people together and say, well, it's one culture. Yeah, well, it's, well, it was, it's, it's that interesting thing about um, introductions is that uh, there's, a, there's a common trope at the moment that if you ask someone where they're from, for most people they will tell you the country they are from. That's, you know, I'm from New Zealand, for instance. But with a, when you ask Americans, of course, they will say what state they are from. But they won't then say in the United States of America. They will simply say I'm from Texas. Whereas if you ask someone from Canada, they will say I'm from Canada. Um, and from, a, from, a, from a, an ancient perspective, obviously, again, you're going to get the person you're asking is not going to identify themselves as Chimerian or Scythian. Or they're going to give them a family or tribal or from a Greek perspective, a police kind of identification. You know, you're not going to get an Athenian saying, I'm from Attica. You're going to get an Athenian saying, I'm from Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, so I think that because you're dealing with a generally Greek sources describing the barbarian, you know, lumping them all together is good enough because it's not quite as, you know, it's not as important to us to know that you're from some tribal group that we don't actually care about. Mm -hmm. 
you're you're just one of them. Um, and I think that that's that's part of the problem as well is that the because we're dealing with our sources describing other cultures and other peoples that it's it's that sort of sense of when they're close by and they're they're likely that we're going to visit them we'll give you more much more finite detail because we know more detail but the further out it just becomes more and more vague and more and more large bodies of yes the africans and yes the troglodytes and yes the this it's very impersonal the treatment that they receive no matter which source and which you know even for the from the Greek period to the Romans, in terms of the Persians, whoever deals with these people, it's a very you know at, at arm's length sort of treatment. Mm. And I mean, mm. most of the names referring to them are actually in refer reference to their weaponry, rather than you know a very generic you know, reference to. Mm. Well, they're using they're either wanderers on horseback or they're using their bow, and therefore that's what we'll label them with. In which case, mm. does the archaeology provide clearer? Um differences between peoples the necessarily Greek or Persian written sources? I suppose an archaeologist would give a slightly different answer to an historian looking at the archaeology um, but from what, what I read of the archaeology on the works and there's a lot coming now with the cooperation with the old Soviet work from the 60s onwards um, that's finally coming into at least the Anglophone world um, you have, I mean it's a classic moment in Maya's book on the Amazons actually, it's a brilliant book uh, discusses a lot of the archaeology related to this and um, there's a beautiful moment where she's describing the Sarmatian, Saramatian, Scythian, Sakai burial, one burial because no one knows which culture it actually is uh, or, or we know roughly what culture it is but we don't know which is the most accurate label to use because they're all sort of usable and I suppose it comes a lot with um, from Herodotus onwards, really, you get the writers trying to use a lot of information from a lot of different places, and you know they try uh, later on they try to use Persian sources and they try to use other Greek sources and everything to accumulate their information, and that's when I think a lot of these names come in and you're sort of like, oh well he used it so I better use it, um, but it's I, I think it's the same group and I think that's where a lot of the name confusions come. We have no written sources from uh, them themselves; they're all the sources from the outside looking in. Yeah, although there is beginning to be evidence that they might have been literate, there isn't any extent of um, actual writings so, or um, history or s even stories, nothing. Not yet. Mm. It's one, one of the difficulties with archaeology is always trying to, to label something as belonging to a particular culture. You mentioned the Celts earlier. If you excavate, uh, you know, if you excavate something in, in France in its its late Iron Age, and it's very quick to put a label on that, it, it's just Celtic. Mm -hmm. If you excavate something in the, you know, along the Rhine, for example, it's a lot less clear cut if something is Celtic or Germanic. And often there is no uh, easy to distinguish elements. So you say, okay, this this has to be Celtic or this has to be uh, Germanic. And one very nice example for it is the the so-called Gundestrup. Uh, cauldron from Denmark, which for the longest time has been heralded as this masterpiece of Celtic uh, um, artwork, and that some people now say is actually Thracian in origin. <laughs> so it's it's very <laughs> difficult to say this is a particular culture and this is another culture. It's you know, if you excavate in the Peloponnese and you, and you you excavate a city, you can say this is a Greek city because you know mm. it's logical. But as soon as you get out of the the areas for which we have loads of uh, written materials and where it's very clear what a particular culture is. I mean, you see it in the Roman Empire also, of course, when you excavate somewhere, is this Roman, is this native, is this, what is this precisely? And um, also with, with Greek colonies in, in southern Italy, for example, the, the, there's always this, this puzzle element about what parts of this tomb can we identify are really Greek and what elements are natives and what does it say about the people buried here? Are they Greek? Are they native? Is it a mixture? Whatever. And it's very difficult for based on the archaeological material solely to, to say, okay, this is that and this is that. So also mm. with the, the Scythians and the Sarmatians, for a historian it's, it's perfectly clear because, you know, Chimerians are, are earlier than the Scythians and then you have the Scythians and later you have the Sarmatians coming to the forefront, but when you look at the archaeology, it, it's it's more difficult, it's more complex. As yeah. such. I think one of the things that the archaeology does show you, though, is that, um, again, with the source material is, is the idea that this is civilization and these are barbarians and that we, you know, when we go to the Black Sea and have colonies, we are civilizing 
the dark places of the world, which again continued for millennia as an idea. Um, but the fact is that with these archaeological um, digs, you find a wealth of material and culture implied by the material itself. Um, and there's clearly ritual, there's clearly a very, very rich tradition that we don't have any source for other than the artifact itself. And so the idea that this was an uncultured society who were barbarian and nomadic and all of these things is is eroded immediately because clearly there was amazing culture and art and society involved that we don't have written sources for. But throughout yeah. everything you've just said, you keep using that word barbarian, which is immediately <laughs> taken the Greek perspective. So. I blame Herodotus. I blame Herodotus. Barbaroi. And we talk about barbarian as in they're not Greek rather than necessarily yes, being barbaric. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, absolutely, my, absolutely. My favourite word of the week is "ipo barbarosi" or something like that, which means uh, to speak Greek rather poorly, which is probably <laughs> what I just did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so could we say actually a lot of these people who are nomadic, wafting around uh, the plains, are p possibly all relatively similar for quite a long period of time, with uh, their allegiances to their own groupings of people be that round families probably it, it's probably something clan based or tribal though it's it's mostly based on on anthropological guesswork i think i'm not exactly sure i i, I personally would be tempted to try and avoid the assumption at least um, i do understand yeah. the, i understand the viewpoint and um it's probably where i think most scholarship sits well, until probably the last couple of years um it's a bit similar. I mean, you, we're going to get lots of analogies, I think, in this session. Um, <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit similar to trying to compare the various um, native tribes in the North America, you know, North America, mm. and just sort of saying, well, you know, they're all pretty much the same, aren't they? You know, they do things in a particularly similar way, um, and they all struggled militarily in a particular way, and they all dealt with things in a particular. So they're all the same, aren't they? Um, but I imagine. Uh, the Lakota tribe, especially, would be very annoyed to hear that. Uh, you know, the Apache tribe, with their uh, their great history with uh, with Geronimo, especially. You know, to compare them is ridiculous when you know more about them. I suppose is the mm. point. Mm. Um, it's dangerous, I think, to make the assumption when we know so little. In which case, how did they all band together? What pulled these people to go and when in times of need? How did they? pulled together, who, was there a controlling clan, tribe, person, ruling structure? It's quite a hard one really. Um, mm. I think you'll, you'll always have dominant groups and you'll always have dominant people. Um, I suppose the, the example that pops to my mind is the Persian invasion of Scythia and um, you have the frantic moment where the Scythians are sending messages out to the further tribes around them, trying to collate uh, a force together. Uh, to try and deal with this invader. Um, it's probably a bit idealistic to just think of it as, you know, only when they're attacked will they come together. Mm. But um, it certainly gives us one example of it happening. Sounds very much like the Persians themselves. I mean, Herodotus sort of argues that the Persians in some way come from the Scythian tribe system themselves. And then you've got later on every dynasty of the, uh, the Persians or their reincarnations as the Parthians and the uh, Sassanid Persians later on, they are essentially a a more how can I say formal tribal system really of alliance rather than a maybe even maybe I could say federation rather than a uh, you know, a pure kingdom as such. Yeah, I suppose you could see the satrapies almost as mini kingdoms. I mean, it's um, especially towards the end of the the fourth century. When you get a lot more uprisings, and you know, sort of middle of the fourth century, you get a lot more uprisings and people trying to assert dominant or sort of power when perhaps they shouldn't, in accordance to what we think of as empires and kingdoms. Um, but you also have to appreciate that the Persians, although they did um, bring together armies from all over their empire, they generally had a standing army that would somehow try and deal with the problem immediately. Mm. Um, it, it didn't always necessarily engage, and it wasn't always necessarily the biggest or the strongest that they could put together. Um, but it was an attempt to try and slow down um, an advance so that the uh, the core of the army could finally come together um, from places like Egypt and further afield. 
Yeah, there are some some analogies that you can make. Again, um, I'm not exactly sure what Herodotus, if Herodotus says anything about marriage rights, for example, but you, you, usually you would expect um, women to marry outside of the, the local tribe and into related tribes or related clans at least. Uh, so that would also reinforce ties among nomadic groups and maybe also nomadic and, and settled groups, I don't know. And religion may have been a binding factor also, of course. I mean, Herodotus goes into mm -hmm. quite some details as far as city and religion is concerned with uh, the emphasis placed on the Scythian equivalent of Ares. Uh, I don't remember mm -hmm. immediately what he's called with this uh, hill that they make of brushwood with this old iron sword that they stick in the middle and then they do ritual sacrifice and stuff like that, mm -hmm. sort of what he describes. Um, that the later Alans or something were still, uh, later nomadic people were still doing also. Uh, so th that might have been a binding factor also. I mean, religion and, and places of cult where different groups would have congregated and met and exchanged ideas and, and traded with each other that would have served to sort of reinforce ties among these peoples themselves. And Herodotus does mention a, a form of uh, ancestor worship sort of popping up amongst, uh, I'm not sure, mm. I can't remember which, mm. is, which of them, it was the Scythians or the Chimerians, um, saying about uh, the eating of the, uh, you know, the flesh of the dead together with the uh, was it pork or something? <laughs> mixed, mixed to make it taste better. Um, but then the, uh, the skull of the dead being cleaned and then uh, you know worshipped as you know, just like the Romans with their wax masks later on, sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So reinforcing bonds. Well, and going back to Yosha's point about um, uh, marriage and things, we we do know from um, more modern versions of nomadism, it's not uncommon to find almost uh, certain taboos. Of marrying within the nomadic group that you're based, because of these strong family ties, and it's almost um, an ingrained way of dealing with incest without it really being approached as such. Um, and also, there's an interesting idea of fostering, and the idea that you'd have a son or daughter and actually send them off to be raised by someone else. Mm -hmm. This isn't completely alien to a lot of cultures, but when you think about it, um, in in say the magic groups which stereotypically you may think of not interacting that often you have this constant presence in each other's camp if they had commercial agreements with the Athenians and they were supplying grain there must have been quite a, a regular structure of of interaction going on um, yeah I was talking more generally about sort of what we stereotype as nomads in general um, no no you're absolutely right what I, what I always love about the especially the Scythians described by Herodotus is this idea of we think of them always as nomads on horses going off into the plains. And uh, he very clearly categorizes some of them as farmers. Uh, he's quite um, absolute about it. And it's something Strabo also um, comments on, that you do have these nomadic groups who don't go anywhere. Yeah, well, they might, have, they might do something like early farmers did. I mean, when f farming was uh, first... Uh, introduced, what you usually saw was that the, the farmers, compared to local hunter-gatherers, uh, were actually tended to be more mobile than the hunter-gatherers because they, the, the mode of agriculture that they, uh, that they were using with lots of burning of land and, and leaving land fallow and then going somewhere else and that sort of stuff. So it, it's also quite possible that these, that these agricultural Scythians, I have no idea whether this is really the case, would also still be nomadic. They don't um, seem to be, I don't think, because yeah. you have the problem with the, uh, you mentioned the Athenian grain supply, and at, right at the start of the Peloponnesian War, the grain supply that's coming from the Black Sea, um, one of the theories about that um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Liz Bainham, uh, once put forward was that the plague start of the Peloponnesian War possibly is down to the supply of bad grain coming from the Black Sea region because there are bad harvests going on and therefore they're being in order to get out their you know their quota of grain that they normally supply to their distributors on the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean they are actually harvesting the grain for uh, sorry the wheat further down um, than they normally would and therefore they're getting the funguses from the, the lower cut grain into the wheat and that possibly started the plague in Athens. 
So if that was mm. accurate, then that's indicating that they're actually staying in one spot, you know, regularly, mm. you know, over a long mm. time period. You know, there's always that um, lifestyle when you go from nomadic to uh, sedentary, as it were, uh, that the, the the pressures of culture and the, and that that then creates difference. You know, that we are a a cultural people who do this traditionally, and you're breaking that tradition by being that, and so that that creates divisions within the society. But from a from a raiding perspective, they then become a fabulous target for raids because you know, as a as a nomadic tribe who raid each other, you know, traditionally, um, they then suddenly become a target that has wealth, and especially through their trade connections, has imported wealth with, you know, new fancy things, suddenly they have that, you know, and so that just con continual warfare, uh, not particularly destructive warfare, but continual warfare will, will sort of just escalate, really. It might be like in terms of, you know, a lot of tribes of Aboriginals in Australia, that they, you know, although they're now sort of tied into a new way of life that is sort of taking away from their traditional nomadic lifestyle, that they will still, you know, take the younger generations out on walkabout, mm. so that they are still continuing yeah. on a, you know, an older tradition, yeah. even though they're tied down. Yeah, and, and there'll be those who say that, you know, you've betrayed your culture by going and living in the city, and there'll be those who say, no, we need to integrate, and then there'll be those who say, no, we need to be, you know, we need to be given possession of the land again, and all, or, you know, so the, again, from the, from a, this perspective, you've got the same sort of thing happening, and because it's such a vast area, um, all of those sort of differences can become uh, exacerbated by the the changes through the influence of Greek wealth coming north. There's always um, there's another option which um, <clears throat> I don't know how much credence it really can have, but um, the entire community doesn't have to be nomadic. Or another way of looking at it is a bit like. Um, Again, I'm going to jump to North America. I know the uh, the Lakota used to have camps that they'd actually move between. But you you would on the outside describe that as a nomad lifestyle. They're constantly moving with the seasons, you know, following the yep. herd of the buffalo and all that. Um, but uh, if you actually look almost at face value, they're just moving from one sedentary place to another. So mm -hmm. if again, this is more speculative, really, but if you had um, stationary groups of, so we say, farming, and then a more of an aristocratic or a, a higher echelon of that tribe was the one that moved. Um, are we really talking about a nomadic group or a nomadic uh, aristocracy within a group? Mm -hmm. It all comes down to perception, really, because we're going on the, the Greek and Persian perceptions mm -hmm. of these people, and yeah. They, yeah. they might not be working on you know a lot of information themselves. They generalizing them and they yep. generalize about the, the weapons as such and whatnot and mm -hmm. why not the nomadic label itself. And you've got to remember the winter, they're gonna be they're gonna be in a camp all winter. They're not gonna they're gonna get find a winter quarters, probably the same one every year because that's the one that works, you know, and it has what they need to have in the winter months and therefore boom, that's where they stay. So I think that you know and then and then again moving as with the buffalo, moving in spring to somewhere new where the pasture is fresh and you know the horses can be fed properly and all that sort of thing so it could easily be just a series of of moves but the fact of moving itself is very un-greek and that that yeah. automatically makes makes them nomadic because they are moving and because of the plains and the vast distances you're dealing with you know bigger than greece itself for a single tribe sort of thing clearly that's that's just a, a culture we can't understand I can't remember which article in the magazine pointed it out, but you'd have thought, uh, as as one of them pointed out, the Athenians would know all about it as uh, their police force uh, was Scythian, which brings us to, to how, how did that work? How do you get an outside body policing your own people? Well, they were mercenaries. It should be pointed out that's not universally accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. It's, but it's it makes the most uh, yeah it it's, does. It's, yeah it does. Um, it, I, I I did a uh, a lecture back when I was doing my PhD thesis on um, Attic vases in particular, uh, where the Scythian arches also uh, were paraded along, and um, there were a bunch of 
ideas as to who they might represent. Mercenaries is one of them. It makes sense. Uh, Athenian interests in the Black Sea region, contacts with the Scythians, that they also hire some of these Scythians uh, to come back to um, to Athens. Um, it has also been suggested, for example, um, that they might be not Sith, not mercenaries as such, but uh, more guest friends of particular mm -hmm. Um, Greeks, where they have a, a more formal relationship, not defined as such by uh, monetary rewards or, or gifts or exchange of gold or whatever, where they are more equals, maybe they are also aristocrats or something, or at least there is some sort of reciprocal relationship where uh, a Greek says, "Hey, why don't you come back with me to Athens for a while, and you can you can you know police the streets and beat some poor Athenians or whatever." Uh, and there are also ideas that the Scythian arches that we see in vast paintings, because vast paintings are the, 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 one of the, the main sources for these, uh, because they appear very prominently in vast paintings in the 6th century BC. So they're this new feature, probably, that, that vast painters then go like, oh, we have to incorporate these guys onto our vases. Um, and uh, another idea is that uh, the Scythian archer came to represent the... the the best arches available, and that also Greeks started dressing up as Scythian archers in order to show, look, I'm a great archer because I dress like these nomadic peoples who are great with with the bow and that sort of stuff. And, On and the one that's... hand, though, there's no evidence, I don't think, from like the written sources as such, to actually say that they are equipped like Scythian archers. That the, no. the, the in no. the written or, written art, oh, sorry, written uh, sources. They're, the most of the time there's reference to them using whips yeah. rather than any other weapon as such in order to enforce laws, etc. So maybe they're in some sort of you know identifiable costume that you know or uniform that identifies them as Scythians, but their weaponry certainly doesn't. But on the other hand, Herodotus tells us that they they are employed or they they start to be employed immediately after the Persian Wars. So does it start out as maybe a, a unit or something that has been left over from the forces of the Persians being in Greece? We know that, for example, Xerxes has Scythians in his army when he arrives in Greece. So whether that, you know, it starts out as a, a mercenary force that switch allegiance or switch employers uh, at the end of that series of wars and then the unit gets continued on, but rather it's the, more the name that actually you know, indicates anything rather than actually the uniforms and the weaponry. Yeah, that's a good point. All the the Scythian archers that you see in in Greek art usually they're they're accompanied by Greek warriors. Also, I mean, there's a very famous vase painting that's also in Stockgrass's book, where you have Greek hoplites and then interspersed you have the Scythian archers, like they're crouching behind the yeah. shields of the hoplites and shooting. So that certainly suggests that they were used in a battlefield situation rather than out in the streets and certainly you know the, the Scythian costume like a lot of the costumes that you see in Greek vase painting might actually be shorthand for something else uh, it need not really correspond to what those guys were really wearing um, there was a, an article by um, um, Ivanchik in which he suggested that uh, Scythian archers were used by vase painters to indicate secondary characters in largely mythological scenes. I don't think he's correct because there are plenty of scenes that are clearly not mythological, I think, where you yeah. see the Scythian archers also appear. So they yeah. seem to be this feature yeah. in the 6th century down to... They disappear, I don't remember exactly when, sometime in, in the first part of the 5th century, but they're popular for a specific length of time in Greek art. It could also be trend in art that, you know, paint me a Scythian because it's the, it's the latest fashion of art that, you know, an artist becomes good at, you know, and, and, and art goes through those functions, you know, that all of, all of, you know, there, there are those phases in Greek art where something clearly becomes the trend and then it dies out as the new trend takes over and, and even, you know, black, red, white figure wear becomes that sort of trending and things like that. Um, so it could it could simply be that idea that that it's something that becomes a trend. Everyone sees your Scythian vase and says, "Oh, I want one of those," and goes to their local potter and says, "I'll oh, give me a Scythian." To the extent that you know, it may it may simply be trending rather than representative of anything, but that doesn't really help 
in terms of what they represent. There are plenty of, of examples like that also, like um, a, a play becoming popular and then you see scenes from that play on pottery or um, th that sort of stuff. Uh, so yes, certainly that's also a possibility. But it, it does mm. seem like a very specific thing to introduce, that it, it must be based on yeah, something. Yeah. So. With early Greek art, you get the the first two identifiable, identifiable stories are uh, Patroclus and um, the the conjoined twins that you get sort of because they're so specifically identifiable. When we get the 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 Moliones first in Greek art, we know they're them because they're conjoined, and therefore we're clearly. There's either lots of conjoined twins in Greece at that time, or that's the one story they're talking about. Yeah, that um, particular Oinokoe Akira... uh, from the 8th century, I don't remember who, I, was it Michael Taylor? I don't remember. He wrote an article in one of the uh, ancient warfare issues uh, in which he, in which the author, I think it was Michael, I'm not sure anymore, in, in which the author suggests that the, the Siamese twin, the, it's positioned right underneath the handle, Instead of yeah. you know at the front of the the bus, and he argues that it's actually two warriors that it's it's one scene beginning on one end and the, the other scene ending where he and, and they just happen to be joined together and it's not actually a Siamese twin. If you that really was, want a, that, a, a mythological that was, scene that, that was, is very that, that was my article. That was, it was your article. <laughs> <laughs> that was my article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so the uh, the, the reason that but but you yeah yeah so well no I wasn't going to mention my own article but um <laughs> the there's 17 examples of conjoined twins, and 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 what I what I thank you, you you absolutely, uh, praise it perfectly. Um, but there's still six, there's still 16 others that have a single set of hips and two heads from a single set of shoulders. So they're much harder to argue that they aren't. Um, and the reason for that vase being identified as a conjoined twin is because there's two heads coming out of a single shield. Mm -hmm. But even if you take that one out of the calculation, there's still 16 examples surviving of conjoined twins. Um, and you know, and then you get the the body over the shoulders of another character, which is you know universally identified as uh, Achilles carrying Patroclus. Um, and so those two mythological stories, and that in some people's arguments leads to every single Greek vase thereafter being interpreted mythologically because they start with mythological stories and therefore um, mythological subject matter dominates from that point forward. Um, so I think from the Scythian archer, there's there's any one of those things can be can be a contributing factor as to why they become so popular for that period of time, and also what do they represent in terms of a you know, are there Scythians like that walking around Athens who are identifiably different um, and whether they are, you know, like with so many other things, you know, they they aren't, if it was a unit that then simply continues through recruitment, but they're no longer Scythian, but they are wearing the same gear, for instance, um, we have no idea of, of telling. But And if they have a function in society that is to discipline, um, that's 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 their identifier rather than oh it's the guy from down the road who joined the police force it's that that you know that that, that function becomes their importance in, the, in society you've got to be careful as well because of some of those written sources a lot of those written sources about Scythians being used to enforce the law are coming from Aristophanes so of course with him who knows there's probably some sort of <laughs> underlying joke that you know our police force are like Scythians or something who knows yeah, yeah. You're not a real Greek, you're a Scythian. <gasps> yeah, I suppose it's a valid point. You don't really know what the symbolism is unless you're told outright. I mean, the, the cla one of the classic cliches of the Scythians is that they're drunk. Um, and you get so many references to them being drunk or drinking in a particular... I mean, you have the classic drinking Scythian wine. You know, the idea of drinking undiluted wine, and it's uh, sort of alleged... The Spartans use it as a reason one of their kings go mad. I think it's Cleomenes. Um, so again, yeah, we, we don't really know what it is they're trying to tell us. Um, it's also interesting that the, I forget who it is, it's one of the orators who says that the force was, well, the force was brought in after Salamis mm. rather than Plataea. Now that might just be a, a reference to, you know, a great victory of Athens particularly. Um, but it is an interesting point that he focuses on Salamis itself. Um, and also, they create an archery force of their own. I'm th yeah. oh, 
It's over a thousand. I think it's sixteen hundred, eighteen hundred. There's three three hundred Scythians in the in their force, and then there's a thousand cavalry and a thousand archers. I think it is mm. that are and immediately he, for. He makes a point that they well, he doesn't make the point, but it is quite evident that they are separate and they're meant to be considered separate. Mm. So mm. that's why I was interested with Yosho's point about um, whether or not actually the Scythian, the Scythian imagery is almost a, a reference to a Greek actually good at archery. When you have this influx of archery in Athens, you know, the sort of unspoken thing in Greek warfare. I, th I think the thing about guest friends also in, in Athens was an interesting in, t in your point about the, the taboos of marriage, that they, what, what from a Greek perspective would be like the giving and taking of hostages or reciprocal friendship from a, from a, a tribal perspective is that whole idea of creating marriage uh, alliances outside of the tribe. And that could be incredibly similar um, within why they provide guest friends for Greek cities, um, but of course from an Athenian perspective where most of our sources come from, the idea of a Scythian coming in and marrying into Athenian society is unthinkable and you know would be would be ruinous to, to Athenian citizenship for instance, but that from their perspective that may be why they send Scythian sons to Greek cities, that, that it could be exactly the same cultural interchange that they're used to within their own society um, and as so often they attempt the same cultural interchange with another culture and it never has the same effect. Uh, it, it is, it's frustrating isn't it because it, uh, your, your mind, oh, well mine does, I don't know about anyone else's, but my mind, mind runs away with it now because they start thinking of almost this warrior rites of passage of sending young men for uh, you know go abroad, do your, um, you know, your grand tour so to speak. And uh, you know, become, come back a proper Scythian after having been in Athens for two years or a year. Or, but of course, we just don't know. We just don't know, and it's a real shame. Isn't it a bit late to that stage for uh, Xenia in terms of Athens and whatnot? I was, I always think of Xenia as being sort of in its sort of heyday, going back into you know, maybe the you know 700s, 600s. No, no, Xenia, as far as no, I know, no, is, a, yeah. it is a tradition that that's covers the entire classical period also as far as I'm aware. There, there's an interesting bit that we were talking about earlier, the association of, of these nomadic peoples and, and heavy drinking, because when you is talking about early mythological representations, one of the earliest things that is clearly mythological is the discovery in a tomb in Left Candy dated to the 10th century of a, of a centaur with a, a gash on his knee, uh, probably Chiron, the, the centaur who got a, a wound. Uh, inflicted by him, uh, by uh, uh, Heracles, um, and centaurs, just like satyrs, also uh, humans with horse-like characteristics, the, the ears of a horse and tails of a horse, both centaurs and satyrs are renowned for their heavy drinking, um, and it, it's, it's sort of, it, I don't know what... I don't know if I have a point to make about this at all, but it's it's interesting that this association between horses and drinking is something that that seems to be very mm -hmm. thoroughly ingrained. And also the the image of these these horse man mixtures seem to be this uh, people unfamiliar with riding horses or something encountering people riding horses. Uh, possibly seeing a horse archer from a dif from a distance that that you know good old um, that that's the the origin of the centaur is the idea that that it's seeing a man on a horse from a distance mm -hmm. where the horse's head is down for instance you automatically associate that it's a it's a horse man creature it's done very well in the um, Dwayne Johnson Hercules film yeah the Rockules movie yeah it's also the Rockules movie. In my mind. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it is a it's, it's a brilliant moment um, it's, it's an interesting take on it, I think, but we're not going to go mm -hmm. into that. But no, just the idea that, uh, that that's how they got around that. You know, you have a classic moment where the silhouette looks exactly like a centaur, everyone agrees it is, and then you just wait, and it's just a, uh, just a movement of the camera, and the light changes, and there it is. It's a man standing up on a horse. Simple as that. The drinking thing's interesting, though, and also the, um, the centaurs, because the centaurs are um, almost become, uh, they almost epitomize barbarism. And uh, the barbarian way, and you know, the links to the north, north of Greece with it. Um, but what always interests me is um, they have another strong characteristic traits which they share with something else the Greeks were obsessed with, 
and didn't really like, which was women. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a few links <laughs> with women. <laughs> so does that bring us on to the Amazons? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, br- Perfectly, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's so subtle. It's amazing. <laughs> the transition. It's so. So tell us about the um, to the Amazons. The Amazons. Well, a fascinating group, really. Um, well, I suppose the important thing to understand with the Amazons, we have this um, warrior, female warrior culture we're told about. And in myth, it's a gynocracy. There are no men most of the time. Um, they, you know, they, oh, you, you get so many differing accounts from differing authors about what it is exactly that happens. Uh, you get some who say that uh, they do have husbands, but the husbands do traditionally women's work. You have others that say men are banished, but they come together for a mass orgy uh, once a year. Um, you get the idea that they kill their sons. Others say that they send their sons off to be raised by men. Um, what... I suppose what's important to understand, especially with the archaeological things that we're finding in um, the Ukraine and around uh, the steppes, is um, the Amazons are not the warrior women that we're learning about. And I think it's quite easy to sort of jump in and go, oh, we found, a, we found an Amazon. And of course, that will sell copies and it will sell papers. And it's, it's a good way to popularize what you're doing. And I, I, I don't begrudge anyone that. Um, but when you actually look at the Amazon myths, they are not what we're seeing. They are a gynocratic society. And from my understanding, I'm happy to be corrected by anyone. My understanding is we've not, we've never yet found one in existence or the um, material culture of what can obviously be described as gynocratic or even a true matriarchy. Yeah, it's it's a problem. There, there's um, I I read an article about uh, this was years ago about the Minoan civilization where it was for the longest time also argued that it was a, a matriarchal society where they worshipped a mother goddess and everything. Um, but there, people no longer really believe that, and haven't for, for decades now, despite recent news about, you know, the, the, the Minoans were more warlike than we usually thought. We already know that. We knew that 20 years ago. But anyway, um, and there have been anthropological searches for matriarchal societies and as far as I know they haven't been found at all. There are no mm. matriarchal societies as such known in, in by anthropologists and um, that's not to say that there are no societies where women have uh, comparatively speaking a, a large amount of power but it's, there are far cry from matriarchal societies. And... I suppose one of the, different, one of the difficulties he says, speaking to five other men, is um, the, um, when you... The, there is just a pure contrast of patriarch, patriarchy and matriarchy, and it's the idea you either have one or the other. Um, mm. I think that causes a lot of problems, and we sort of talk, you know, the, the ideal is what we're trying to strive for today with egalitarianism and everything, yep. um, but we don't sort of accept that on a historical basis. If we have almost a quasi... Um, egalitarian society, if we can call it that, we feel the need to either refer to it as either matriarchy or patriarchy. Um, it does seem like a very strong literary device, really, most of the time when the Amazons mm-hmm. appear. I mean, every time they appear, they seem to be up against the epitome of a, you know, the, the masculine leader, whether it be Heracles or whether it be Achilles or whether it be Alexander the Great, so mm-hmm. having his um, mm-hmm. tryst with the uh, queen of the Amazons when she sort of turns up and says, "Let's make the perfect child." Um, it, it's contrasting in a in a very populist fashion. Just an aside on the Alexander thing. What's interesting about that is um, I think it's Thalestris, I think is her name. Anyway, the Amazon queen there actually says, "If I have a son, I will send him to you to be raised." Yeah. Which again reinforces that sort of that Amazon idea, but also goes back to what we were talking about with nomadism. Um, mm. And uh, there's the idea of sending your child off to be raised by someone else. And I think with the with the Athenian sources, especially, the idea of the the Amazon is so wrong, you know, that that it's it's a, not a woman's place and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, and even even the Aristophanes play playing on that idea uh, of what is the, what is the woman's role. Mm. Um, and you know, whereas other cultures within Greece have a far more 
uh, dominant female role in Sparta, for instance, um, where where the idea of Amazon women, based on what we know of the the, the Spartan view of wives and 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 girls, will be like, yeah, of course, um, but. Uh, just that sort of sense of this is so completely wrong and this is just not what a woman's function is. Mm. Um, you know, even with the, the Pentezza liar and all that sort of thing. What's also quite interesting on that is um, Greece has examples of women fighting mm. in history. Um, so sometimes we get sort of stuck on Am Amazons means warrior woman. Actually, if you think of just a warrior woman as a woman engaged in warfare, um, which mm. is not a, this is not uncommon at all through any period of time. Um, Greece, amazingly, for its polarization that we think about, has its examples, and of course they're always um, exceptional circumstances. Um, so you have the Argive women uh, resisting Cleomenes' army after his victory on the, in the field, and he thinks he's going to take Argos because it's empty, not realizing, well, not caring that it was full of women, and the women actually make a stand and try and confront him, mm. uh, and successfully defend Argos, amazingly. Um, uh, there's also the example, you get things that, you, more in sieges, um, at the siege of Plataea, the women, actually sorry, it's before Plataea, when the Thebans have infiltrated, the women are described as being on the rooftops, throwing tiles and stones and actually attacking mm. uh, a strong um, unit of hoplites. So there certainly is precedent, and what what really interests me um, with these examples is they're not described as Amazons. You would mm. think this is a prime example to go a very Amazon-like appearance. You know, this is quite um, you the Greek. This may not conform with what the Greeks want from their women or expect from women, but you would still expect it to be considered a good thing that they did it. Um, yeah. And it would be a prime example to kind of go. They acted like Amazons. They would, you know, to describe one of them as being like Hippolyta or you know anything like that. But it doesn't happen at all. But again, the focus isn't necessarily on those women in their actions. A lot of the time, in those literary sources, the focus is on uh, the you know uh, the attackers and the fact that they are getting beaten back by even the women and the young boys and the old men mm -hmm. is sort of derogatory of them. There's one point though with those uh, Greek women that that defend uh, um, their their community. Uh, I think the the point is that the Amazons aren't just warlike. That's not their most distinguishing feature, but that they're that they're very clearly uh, uh, anti-man as such. Uh, you know, where they they don't raise the boys or send them off, and where they really are just focused on uh, having this this society completely governed by women as such. Mm. Um, at least in, in my understanding. So to say that, that women that defend a, a city in historical times say, oh, these women are like Amazons, I don't think that would have that would have entered the mind of a, of a, a Greek writing about it because mm. the, the Amazons were more than just warlike women. They were also women who uh, did not associate with men usually. It's a perversion of roles rather than... Um, yeah, exactly. You know, it's, 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 yeah. When Artemisia behaves like a good Greek being tricky and and a, a brilliant general and you know and the comment is that my my all my men are women and my woman is a man from mm. from Xerxes that that sort of sense that there's no sense there that she's an Amazon that she's somehow mm. commanded ships at the Battle of Salamis badly it's that she's she's put one over on the on the Persian king because she's from Halicarnassus and you know and again that could be Herodotus being very very pro Halicarnassus but yeah. that there's no sense of that. It's it's a celebration stratagem. You celebrate what what Artemis what Artemisia did, um, rather than uh, associate her with this yeah this changing of the the, the right way of things, the mm. way that the Amazons do. So is the whole thing a complete uh, mythology then? I mean, what I'm hearing is that Greeks aren't calling women Amazons when they're fighting, and it doesn't appear to be anything behind it at all. It's like a headline writer wrote something, and then it's proper nonsense. What you see, um, well, what we see from Herodotus, but I, I have a feeling it probably was earlier than Herodotus, but we just don't have anything surviving, is um, an attempt to historicize the Amazons from this mythological world they've lived in. Um, and it's a fascinating moment when um, he, he gives a story of the, the birth of the Saramatian tribe. Uh, where the Amazons are defeated 
at their um, capital, uh, um, Themyscira, uh, on the Thermodon River, which is just northern Turkey, just on the Black Sea. He actually, he actually makes a point which I think is sometimes ignored. The surviving Amazons, of which there are only about, I think it's two, three hundred, are taken um, by boat, and there's this whole storm, and then they land in uh, around the um, modern Crimea, and then they meet the uh, Scythians. But the important point is, these are the only surviving Amazons left, according to Herodotus's account. So he basically ends the Amazons, if you think about it, and then moves them. And he moves them to interact with the Scythians. And then you have this whole quest with the young, with the young men. Uh, there's originally a battle, and then they realize they're fighting women, which doesn't conform with what we know of the Scythians, but we'll ignore that because it's Herodotus. And um, then they decide, we'll send the young men out to woo them, you know, because that will work well. Um, <laughs> And then the basically the sexual allure mixed with the uh, mixed with the romanticism of the whole idea, or whatever you want to read into the story, um, the Scythians run off with the Amazons, and then they create the Sarmatian tribe. Um, so unless I'm mistaken, uh, which I'm happy to be corrected on, uh, Herodotus actually ends the myth at that point in his own narrative, and says, right, that was then, and here is the historical community they produced, and we we know them. And we can interact with them. So it's almost as if it's almost as if he came across a story too close to the Amazons. Yeah, it, it sounds almost like Virgil and the foundation of the Roman race coming from Troy. I mean, it's all stuff and nonsense, but it makes a damn good story, doesn't it? I mean, so it, it, it helps you explain how things are today by inventing this rather uh, a glorious uh, story behind it. The problem is the inconsistencies of the writing. Um, so the very first, well, the oldest account, which is actually more of an epitome that comes through um, Proclus, I think, um, describes Penthesilea as Thracian. Not as Scythian, not as Saramatian, but as Thracian. Um, and then uh, the Amazons, through the stories as they come to us through later dates, they start to move, and of course, people have made much of this and the idea that you know they just keep being moved to the periphery of Greek of the Greek world and all that. Um, but it does sort of raise more questions about uh, the origin of the myth and if there is an origin or if they just invented it. Uh, there is um, an argument that um, basically any idea of women having any form of um, power in a pseudo patriarchy, for want of a better word. Um, needs explaining to a Greek mind, and it needs to be uh, somehow understood. And the only way to uh, this is this is Adrian Mayer. This is I'm, I'm reading her book at the moment. Uh, the only way that this can make sense is for women to have all control, for women to uh, be present in battle in any way. The only way to explain it is they have all control over men, and men can't be there. If if they are at all, they must be injured or disabled, or the stories of them being maimed quite early on, and muscles being Cut so that they uh, they lose their dominance of the, over the female form, shall we say? And there's also you know there's also the 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 myth of the the female form being mutilated itself. You know the the idea that because they were also archers, the the the, the, the cutting off of the breasts and things like that. You know that that which is again something that's controversial, but um, yeah, also absolutely. about that. You know that 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 the mutilation idea of of what is a woman's role, and if a woman does that to herself, then clearly things are very wrong with with their world. Sort of probably ties in with the idea of maiming men so they can't dominate. But you know, things are wrong. That's yes, and it needs explaining. Yes. Yeah. Even if it means making things up. The the one thing we've not really looked at is actually how they waged war. Mm -hmm. You know, how how did they uh, use the cavalry, and how how did that uh, work against um, opposition that they were fighting against, and how did people cope with that, and how did they uh, use the, their archers, or, you know, from the cavalry? Because that's obviously a, a, another big thing, especially if you're looking at the Greeks who are, who are not necessarily known for um, cavalry. Well, I think the 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 major tactic is is raids, and that therefore it is probably smaller scale. Uh, but then when we come across them in the sources, of course, they're being 
either, as we said before, mercenaries or being recruited into other people's uh, armies, mostly as archers, I think. But then you've got that issue of, um, you know, is that, whereas the archaeological record, I think it's uh, mostly it's axes. Um, so, so clearly there are different styles of fighting, but, but generally they are regarded as cavalry archers, aren't they? Mm. Well, you've got the famous uh, Parthian or Bactrian shot that everybody sort of talks about, and I think that sort of gets more airtime, obviously, sort of in the later uh, Hellenistic mm. period, etc. And you know, as soon as Alexander the Great sort of picks them up as a as a, um, a unit that he takes from the Dahai uh, into, down into India, operating in that style, I think that sort of you know, popular popularizes that. But whether that can actually then be said to have been the style going back into the early history of the peoples. Mm. I'm trying to remember. I'm sure there is a depiction from Greece of someone doing the Parthian shot mm. and still amusingly referred to as a Parthian shot, rather anachronistically. Um, but when you've got a name, you've got a name, haven't you? Um, but they are, they're certainly renowned for um, running away while still fighting. And there's very much this idea that they'll retreat to fight to retreat. I mean, it's the exact pattern we're used to, or we get used to later on. And yet, the the Sarmatian cavalry later, there's the the, the heavy armoured cavalryman also sort of comes from the same area, which is sort of the a contradiction that that if you have the the horse archer who's able to fight and flee continuously because of where they normally wage war, uh, and then suddenly the heavy armoured cavalryman, it's, it's it's sort of um, almost a contradiction. But could that possibly be a reaction to, you know, say, the likes of Alexander and the Hellenistic monarchs uh, bringing more of that heavy cavalry in? And I mean, as they sort of e head east and they have to sort of um, acclimatise to the fighting styles of that and sort of drop some of their more heavier units as such, in an opposite way, you could have the, uh, you know, the horsemen having to take up some more heavier, uh, sorry, heavier cavalry in the same way, in an opposite direction. Of course, the interesting thing is that not everybody fought on horseback, as far as we know. Of the steppes, as in of the Scythians, of the Chimerians. Well, I'm not exactly sure we have the, the, the material to say about what they did in their own territories, so to speak. But when you see the Scythian archers, they're always on foot, usually. They're never on horseback, depicted in art. And also the the famous gold comb that they found in uh, uh, along the Black Sea coast, if I remember correctly, it also shows a Scythian archer. It was also not not on horseback, for example. So the, mm. there is uh, a lot more variety. It, it's sort of a stereotype to think these are all they they all fight as uh, light cavalry, or indeed later the Sarmatians as heavy cavalry. Um, but that might not be one hundred percent reflective of the truth, maybe. Well, when, um, on a larger scale, especially um, in the sort of earlier classical periods, when, uh, so, I mean, again, one of the best examples we have is Herodotus' description of the Persian invasion of Scythia. Um, and you have uh, this sort of classic moment where they just, on the surface of it, you'd say they just don't engage and they're afraid of fighting the Persians. But when you look into it, it's, uh, they've actually split their forces into two and they're completely manipulating the Persian movements through their lands. They've got one um, uh, further distance that they know is going to be pursued and then they've created a second group which only stays I think it's a day ahead so that they can, all, they can basically direct them into this war of attrition without ever engaging with them and it's only when the Persians are said to um, start to retreat uh, that they do finally engage and I wonder if um, if that's when the sort of infantry become involved, when there's an offensive, because I do question how fast uh, a, even a lightly armed infantry army can move to keep up with what presumably is a, um, a mounted force. Do we know anything of their uh, infantry? Um, presumably they didn't fight as hoplites or anything like that. They were using axes and possibly swords. No, John, the answer to your first question is really no. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> no. yes. Um, you, you wouldn't have them as hoplites, yeah. I, I would say axes, swords, uh, yep. uh, knives. You have the famous description of their razors, but that's more scalping. Mm -hmm. um, but you're certainly talking close quarters, at least. 
Yeah, I think the the war god was supposedly also worshipped in the form of a sword, according to uh, to Herodotus, if I recall correctly. In in that whole description with the, the the religious iconography, where he also says that Ares or their equivalent of Ares is their most important god, that the sacred object is a is an old iron sword. Yeah. Mm. So that yeah, that would, that would make sense. Oh, no, I was going to say the other interesting thing about um, especially again the the Scythians is um, their contrast with the Persians allows us, as um, Hellenophilic historians, to see the Persians fight someone completely different. And actually, when you see uh, the complaints about the Scythians not engaging with the Persians, the Persian king sends almost this complaint saying, fight me, will you please fight me? Um, it's kind of counterintuitive to what we always presume of Persian warfare. And it's, sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a nice reminder uh, that mm. the Persian war machine, for want of a better word, had to deal with a lot of varying cultures, a lot of varying military um, traditions. Um, I mean, the three classic are the Egyptian, the Greek, and the Scythian, and they're three completely different ways of fighting and different lands. Yeah, most armies of big empires usually want dis single decisive conflicts, mm. so a single siege to end the war, a single big battle yep. to end the outcome. So it's it's infuriating when you have an enemy that is nomadic, that has these light troops that keep running away when you get close. Uh, I can mm. I can imagine. Yeah, normally meet me on meet me at three o'clock on Wednesday and we'll fight it out. <laughs> so, yeah. And then they go like, hey, here we are. Oh, no, oh no, we're not. <laughs> Where they are? Oh. Yeah. Well, that seems like a good place to leave it. I'd like to thank Joshua, Murray, Lindsay, Owen, and Mark. Next time out, we'll be looking at the Seleucid Empire at war. Don't forget, for further information on the magazine, go to ancient-warfare.com. This has been the Ancient Warfare magazine podcast brought to you by thehistorynetwork.org. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. 